go. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brother Love, and uh, if there's one thing I love, I love Diablo 2. So today we're going to have a brief discussion on the metaphysical, which we colloquially call the, uh, you know, the spiritual realm and so forth, and the biblical history and the, the worldly history, and some of the lore in Diablo. And, you know, just, just to show you guys uh, just how deep the rabbit hole goes on this, Jordan Peterson would say, he's a very famous professor from Canada who wrote a book for How to Improve Your Life, he would say that some truths are so self-evident that they must manifest themselves through different layers of society as we know it. So just just right off the top of my head, right off the bat, I'm just going to say uh, you don't have to agree with everything I say in this video, but I think it is quite self-evident that there is a deeper truth hidden in Diablo 2, and I would like to explore that a little bit. Well, Brother Love, what do you mean by a deeper truth? <clears throat> yeah, I know it's a video game, Diablo. Everybody knows Diablo is supposed to be Satan, but they changed the name before the game came out because they thought that would impact sales, blah, blah, blah. It's not a big deal. Uh, in Spanish, Satan means the devil, and, you know, Diablo, blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about these these ideas, these concepts, these things that Jordan Peterson says must manifest themselves through, you know, different types of media. Do we have any examples of that in Diablo? We do. In fact, let's go to our very first one, and this is the NET version of the Bible on the eSword. You can get it for free. Um, it, notice this right here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Hmm, isn't, isn't that interesting? The Nephilim. Where else have we heard this word Nephilim before? Diablo 2. Hey, there's... There's something that shows up that you don't hear every day. Let me tell you guys, I studied the King James Version of the Bible for 30 years of my life and never once did I hear that word. Now, let's go take a look real quick. Let me show you what I'm talking about. King James Version right here. And there were giants in earth those days. Huh. Well, that's weird. There were Nephilim right here. Nephilim. In the earth those days. So why does the King James decide to make it into giants and this specifically name it Nephilim? I can't answer that from you, but this is the roots of where we get the Nephilim from. Um, so let's read this whole passage because this is going to bear on the lore of Diablo somewhat. I'm not an expert in the lore of Diablo because it's made up foo-foo, but there's some actual meat on the bone if we dig deeply into history. Uh, when humankind began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humankind were beautiful. Thus they took wives from themselves from any they chose. Now here we have a divergence in belief. Uh, half of Christianity, maybe even up to words of 70%, believe this is talking about men who were the sons of God. They were righteous men. And these are girls who were unrighteous. And they fall. They have a fall of mankind here. Um, but there's 30%, let's say, that see this as a spiritual matter. And for those of us who, myself included, who do see it that way, when it says sons of God, we're thinking angelic beings saw the daughters of men. And that's based upon the totality of everything I'm going to show you today, right? Uh, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful. They took wives. Uh, the wives were actually known as, uh, oh my gosh, what is their name? Of course, I'm going to forget it now when I'm in the middle of it. Uh, what? Siren. That's it. They were known as sirens because remember, sirens from mythology are the ones that the boats will dash themselves on the rocks and so forth. Uh, I'll get more into that in just a second. Uh, so the Lord said, My spirit will not remain in humankind indefinitely since they are mortal. They will remain for 120 more years. So God punishes mankind. They can no longer live, you know, like 969 years like Methuselah did, right? The Nephilim were on earth in those days. Now, there's several references in the Bible to the Nephilim. 
and it almost always has to do with these giants that just suddenly appear out of nowhere. Notice it also says, and also after this. What led to the creation of the Nephilim? Uh, well, some of us would believe, and you establish your own faith, that angels with the daughters of humankind bore children. Those children don't have souls and spirits like we do, uh, but they were fantastical. They were giants. Uh, when the sons of God were having kissy time with the daughters of humankind who gave birth to their children, they were the mighty heroes of old and famous men. Some people think this is where we get our idea of Hercules and you know Zeus and Achilles and all those mythological tales. I'm not sure. I don't know. Because this is as much history as we get about this entire thing in the Bible. Here's Nephilim. Here's where they came from, but the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind had become great. He decided to destroy the earth. He told Noah, build a boat, blah, blah, blah. It's super interesting stuff, right? We, we have uh, the Nephilim making their first appearance. Uh, what other things are in Diablo that we can see in the Bible, that we can see in, uh, in history, in our cultures? What, what other things are in Diablo? Well... Uh, this guy wrote a book. His name uh, is Alexander Hislop. And uh, this was a preacher who lived, golly, I don't know, 150 years ago? Something like that. Some long, long time ago. It was against the Catholic Church. He wrote this book, The Two Babylons. And in it, we get this idea from all the research that he did. And he talks about Bell and his wife Semiramis, who we know as Ashra, Ashtaroth, uh, Ishtar. She's got so many different names. Um, and Baal is something that we see in Diablo. And so let's go back to Genesis 6 and let's see what interesting things happened during this flood-like period. So interesting. Oh, we're going to destroy the whole earth, blah, blah, blah. Moving right along. Oh, yeah, we're going to destroy every living thing. Let's keep going. The flood starts to go away. God makes a covenant with Noah. Super interesting. Let's see. We are looking for a very specific descendant here. Ah, here we go. And Cush was the father of Nimrod, and he began to be a valiant warrior on the earth. Now, that's a... That's a that's an interesting translation. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So if you look into the actual Hebrew of this, the idea isn't that, oh, this guy is a God-blessed person. He's such a good person. No, the idea is this is one of Satan's champions rising up who stands face to face to God and says, you know, I disagree with everything you stand for. What we have here is Nimrod, according to... Our, our, our good buddy over here, our good buddy Alexander Hyssop, was the first major king of Earth after the Flood. And, you know, he's involved in Babylon and the Tower of Babel and all that jazz. So, supposedly, his wife was Semiramis, who we know now as Ashtaroth. And uh, his son was Tammuz. And if any of you know anything about Judaism, one of the months is named after Tammuz. So it's, it's, it's super interesting stuff, this, this Nimrod. But again, this is all we get in the Bible about Nimrod. So brother love, if you love history and you're willing to admit you're in the minority of people who believe this type of thing, why would you possibly ever believe that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this really fast and then we'll move on with our little talk. I'm going to show this really fast. Uh, in the New Testament, there's a very short book, ladies and gentlemen. Very short. Uh, his name is Jude, right? It's one chapter. Teeny tiny, but it's in the New Testament. Now, if you've ever been in church, whenever they get to this one tiny little chapter, they skip a lot of it, and they don't talk about it. But uh, let's, let's read Jude chapter 1. Uh, verse 6. You also know that the angels, the what? The sons of God, the angels. Why does it call it angels there? 
Let's let's see what let's see what other translations call it. Oh, the angels. Oh, that's so interesting. Angels, 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 and oh, look at that. The majority of people who translate the Bible translate it as angels. Huh? That's so weird. You know, me and you, because we just read the scriptures in Genesis chapter 6, that the angels did not keep within their proper domain in heaven. But they abandoned their place of residence, and he has kept in eternal chains in utter darkness, locked up for the judgment of the great day. So their punishment is, they're in this place that we would know as Abaddon right now, which is also in Diablo. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Abaddon is a place that you can go to in, uh, I don't know, it's a, like an Act 5. It looks like an Eye of Sauron. A lot of fire resistance is in there. But isn't that super interesting? That is right smack dab in the New Testament right here. Ba-bam. But don't nobody ever talk about this because it's not popular to talk about. What in the world could they possibly be talking about here, Brother Love? I'm glad that you asked. Let's go down this rabbit hole a little bit deeper. Super interesting. Let's see. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Now, I want to talk to you about when Jude was written. There's another book that was super popular in the early church. Yeah, believe it or not, guys, we didn't have the Bible, the entire history of the church. I, I know this is going to shock some of you guys, but Jesus didn't come off the cross and say, here's your copy of the Bible. This is everything that you need, you know? Now, I will agree that everything you need for salvation is within the pages of the Bible. Absolutely. But if you want a little bit more history, let's take a look at this. Uh, look, the Lord is coming with his thousands of thousands of his holy ones, his angels, right, to execute judgment. Where did Jude get this saying from? Now, I'm going to offer you a possible explanation. Because this had happened in history before, depending on the dating of texts. Let's, let's go to that real quick. Oh, look, it's the Book of Enoch. Oh, man, we, we love the Book of Enoch. And behold, he cometh with his ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and destroy all the ungodly. That's so weird. That's so weird that something in the Bible is found in other literature almost word for word, huh? Maybe there's something to this Book of Enoch. Well, I'm glad that we that we mentioned that. Let's let's look at what else might be in this beautiful book of Enoch. This is the actual dude that wrote the book, The Two Babylons. Um, book of Enoch, right here, super fascinating. Do you do you want an idea what early Christians, I'm talking first century, believed about you know Genesis chapter six? Is right here, and it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days there were born to them beautiful women. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and wanted them and said to one another, Hey, let's go down there and get wives from among the children of men, and we will have children. So this very specific angel who was the leader, Simjaza, said to them, I fear that you will not all do this. And I'm going to have to pay the penalty by myself. But they all answered, we're all going to swear an oath and we're all going to do it. And here's all the names of the angels who are the leaders of the tens of angels who fell. That means for each of these that you count, there's ten angels underneath them that all fell at the same time. This is what precipitated the Great Flood. So interesting. This is why Brother Love believes the way that he believes. Uh, I'm just showing you through history, through the Bible. I've been studying the Bible my entire life. Um, <laughs> it's just too big of a coincidence. And then you look at the prime evils in Diablo, right? I, I can't help but if you've ever read the book of Enoch, it smacks you in the face. Because these same people that we just read about are going to teach mankind the ways of warfare, the ways of, uh, you know, aborting a baby, let's put it that way. Um, the ways of casting spells of it's, it's, see this tells you exactly what they did Azazel taught them knives and shields and breastplates and uh, the art of working on them bracelets and ornaments the use of um, antimony and the beautification of the eyelids so makeup all kinds of costly stones and coloring tinctures and there rose much uh, godlessness 
and they committed fornication, they were led astray, became corrupt in other ways. Simjaza taught enchantments, that's casting of spells, the root cuttings, which we would know as alchemy, um, herbology, uh, arm aros, uh, the resolving of enchantments, this one astrology, this one constellations, this one the knowledge of weather, um, let's see, the course of the moon. Yeah, like, it's super fascinating to read this stuff. It, like, tells you exactly what each one of these evil angels who came down and took the daughters of men uh, became. But let's get back to the Nephilim, because I know you're saying, oh, you're going a little bit too deep down the rabbit hole, Brother Love. We're not, we're not that interested in the Book of Enoch. Let's get back to the Nephilim. So, some interesting thoughts biblically about the Nephilim, okay? Uh, why did Jesus cast out demons in the New Testament? Can anybody answer me that? Why did Jesus cast out demons in the New Testament? This is, this is super fascinating stuff. Why were there demons then, but not now? You want me to, to answer that for you? It's, it's really easy to answer. Boom. Right here. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. So, remember that angels are eternal beings. They're down there in chains. And their wives were mortal. They were known as sirens. Um, and I'm going to get to something very interesting about that in a second. But let's talk about these offspring of the angels. Uh, they're known as Nephilim, right? Some people consider them giants. Some people consider them uh, many different... The way they appear in many different ways. For example, just giving an example, Dagon, who was the god of the uh, Philistines who kept attacking during, like, you know, Samson's time and all that. Dagon. Uh, there's a movie about Dagon. Uh, he's like a fish god kind of thing. They made a movie about that recently in Hollywood. It's, I think it's called The Shape of Water. That is a very Dagon-like Nephilim. Again, mating with the, the beautiful French deaf girl, right? I mean, again, like Jordan Peterson would say, the truth is so true it has to be manifested. Through our, through our medium of our current culture. So here we see it manifested not only in Diablo and its lore, we also see it manifested in lots of the movies that we watch. Tons of movies about this kind of thing. You got The Ninth Gate, um, excellent movie for this type of thing. You got The Dark Song, The Shape of Water. Um, oh my gosh, so many starry eyes. Uh, there's so many movies that briefly touch on these ideas. And I'm not saying to watch those movies. I'm just saying, where are these people getting these great ideas from? And I'm explaining that to you from Genesis chapter 6, from Jude, and from the book of Enoch, which I've shown you two different versions of the book of Enoch. There, there are multiple versions. Uh, they say the same thing, but there's, there's two texts. You don't want to get them confused because one, one has pretty much been rejected wholly by the uh, academic society. Uh, let's go back to Alexander Hislop real quick. Now, Brother Love's going to be the first person to admit that uh, this dude has some strange beliefs. He was definitely anti-Catholic, 100%. But everything you're going to read about him doesn't dwell on the anti-Catholicism aspect of what he teaches. They dwell on the, oh, he tried to connect Easter with uh, Asheroth. And that's wrong. I, I, I completely concede that point. 100%. I'm, I'm not here to fight that war. Um, some of the stuff that he believed was correct when he wrote it, but through further archaeology and study of languages, we have a better understanding of certain things. I'm going to give you guys an example. The Kone Greek. You guys may never have heard that in your entire lives because... For the majority of our lives, we thought there was one kind of Greek. And that's what the New Testament was translated into. But it turns out there was a very specific type of Greek the New Testament was translated in. It's called Kony Greek. And people are still unraveling its mysteries even as we talk now. Now, nothing major is going to change. Just small stuff like with the, uh, the Easter and, you know, Astra, stuff like that. The uh, actual, you need to get baptized and all that junk. Uh... All that wonderful stuff, I should have said, my apologies, uh, definitely, definitely still holds true. Uh, like I said, I believe God has given the common man everything he needs to please him and make it to heaven. 
No problem. So let's get back to this Nephilim and this uh, The Watchers thing. There's another video game series called The Wasteland, and one of the characters, no, Borderlands, that's it, Borderlands. One of the characters you can play is literally like, <laughs> they're like literally named <laughs> something like that. Um, gosh, I can't remember. I'd never played that particular game, but I remember hearing about it. So let's talk about these sirens real quick. They're super interesting. So you know how beautiful they were? Men dashed themselves on the rocks in their ships. Angels come down to heaven to be with these beautiful women. Let's face it, women are beautiful. There's, there's no doubt about it. There's whole industries devoted to magazines and movies and, and what have you, art, because women are beautiful and men are powerful and strong. God made us that way. Um, but isn't it super interesting that these women were able to, to get these angelic billing, you know, beings to come down to earth? And they do kind of the same thing today. You got this new song coming out. It's this young, beautiful singer, like a siren. And we're all mesmerized. And we, who's going to be the next one? South Park did a very excellent episode about, oh, this crop of corn coming in this year is going to be real good. And it goes from like one starlet to the next starlet, from Brittany to Miley to, it, we always got the next best 16-year-old beautiful starlet coming along who we, you know, <laughs> Who gets people to cast their souls upon the rocks, frankly. I mean, if, if we're, if we're going to get down to the nuts and bolts of it, uh, there's quite a few men who would happily give up everything about their eternal life just to be with one of these women. Um, gosh, there's this one particular actress. I don't know what her name is. Like, is it Daya or something like that? She's in Spider-Man. She's in The Greatest Showman. She's in... Uh, Gosh, what else was she? She was in Dune. All the love interests, right? I can remember when I was a kid, the exact same thing happened with another another actress. She was in the movie Blade Runner. They, she was also in Dune. Um, it, Hollywood's the same. They, they put out these sirens, these beautiful women that men just would kill to be with. And, you know, men love idolatry. They... They see with their eyes, and uh, the eye is never full, ladies and gentlemen. You will never see enough beauty in your life to, to feel the lust and the desire of your eyes. Um, so we looked at the music industry. We looked at uh, the movie industry. Um, yeah, isn't, it, isn't that interesting that, that women hold such a power? Uh, it's super interesting. So we got the Nephilim. Okay, let's talk about where, where did Bell and Asheroth come from. Well, if you guys aren't familiar with the Bible, which I just assume, you know, most of the audience of the Diablo franchise probably will not be. Um, the ancient Jewish people, known as the children of Israel, dealt with two false gods their entire history. I mean, it was difficult. They struggled, they kept falling away from God and following these false gods. So let's talk a little bit about them real quick. You remember how in Genesis chapter 6 that we had Nimrod? You remember? You remember? Well, it wasn't chapter 6, it was like chapter 10 or 11, something like that. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, Nimrod. So Nimrod being the first king of the earth, I'm just going to tell you that's, that is my belief. I think that historically he was the first king in the earth. Um, they built the Tower of Babel and all that jazz. His wife was Samaramis. Uh, when they died, when they died, uh, Nimrod, they wanted to remember this first great king of the earth. So they made an idol in his image, and his name was Baal. That's what we get in Diablo. His wife, they made an image of her. The name was Ashtaroth or Ashara or Ishtar or however you want to pronounce her. And we see this in all the major civilizations in you know in Egypt you got Isis and and all that in uh, Greek mythology you got Zeus and Hera and then there's Roman mythology and there's Canaanite mythology we got all these mythologies but they all come from the same place in my belief right here Nimrod who was forever memorialized as Baal or the Baals or you guys remember when Moses went up there and he was talking to God face to face and God was writing down the Ten Commandments? What did the children of Israel create in their midst out of their golden out of their golden earrings? 
What, what image, what idolatry did they produce? Can, can anybody tell me that? Let's, let's go to exit this real quick and just take a, there's Moses in the burning bush. We got to get down a little bit. Oh, Ten Commandments. Oh, that's good stuff. I love the Ten Commandments. Um, laws. We got lots of laws. Lots of good stuff in here. Where's the, uh, but I'm wondering where's the Aaron and all that jazz. Where's the, let's get to the good stuff. Command about leaving a sign. Oh, here it is, the golden calf. All right. So while Moses is up there talking to God and God's writing with his own hand, the only thing ever handwritten by God other than the writing on the wall in the palace of Belshazzar before he dies, right? Um, we have God writing the Ten Commandments down. And while he's doing that, they made a molten calf. Well, if you know anything about Bel, Bel represents war and power, and he's often portrayed as a bull, a calf. Even in America, on Wall Street, you know, you call something a bullish position or a bearish position. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's really disseminated through our entire society. I mean, it's there. Super interesting that they made this calf. In other places, let's just take a quick search right here. Um, <laughs> well, if I could spell, it would it would be much better. Uh, look at this Queen of Heaven. Who is this Queen of Heaven? Well, I'll tell you. That is that's Asherah. That's that's the exact same person. This Queen of Heaven. They they had lots of Queen of Heaven worship, lots of bell worship. Now, Queen of Heaven is a fertility symbol. She's uh, lust and beauty and you know all of the things that we as men get attracted to that that end up getting us in a lot of trouble. Um, but let me show you guys Ashara right here. So in ancient Jewish tradition, in the worship of Ashara, they would make what are known as Ashara poles, right? They're phallic symbols that uh, represent fertility. They would put them in all their high places, all their places of worship. Um, in fact, when one of the kings took over Israel, it says this in 2 Kings, Josiah, he was a really good king, if you guys ever heard me talk about Josiah before. Really good king. Oh, look, there's an Asherah pole right there inside the temple of the, the Lord where the women wove coverings for the Asherah pole. <gasps> and look at this. He, he destroyed the shrines that King Solomon had built for Asherah. It's the same name, Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Asherah, the Queen of Heaven. Same, same thing. Um, isn't that fascinating? Huh. You guys ever hear the story about the archaeologists when they were digging up uh, in Egypt, you know, the ancient mummies and all that stuff? They came across some objects that we would call toys for adults who love each other very much. That's what we would call those nowadays. But they were so horrified by what they dug up the ancient Egyptians, which was a shower worship, they broke them so that nobody would ever see the uh, the detestable, sinful things that they found in the tomb. Uh, that's humanity, guys. From day one, from Genesis chapter one, all the way to modern day, to like some 7,000 years later. Humans have always been the same. We want money. We want power. Yeah, Belle's awesome. The God of War, Belle. Yeah, Asher is great. She reminds me of Miley Cyrus. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, this this thing has always been the same throughout humanity. Um, and that's pretty much my thoughts on the Nephilim, Belle, Asherah. Uh, well, you know, we have some Abaddon stuff that we could talk about, but it's barely mentioned in Diablo lore, but Abaddon's the angel of death. Uh, another way to look at Abaddon is uh, there's a place prepared for those angels who were cast down that's also known as Abaddon, right? So in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there's some, some mention of Abaddon. And, and the interesting thing about Diablo, if you think about Satan, from a Judaic mindset, from a child of Israel mindset, Satan isn't the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. Uh, not exactly. Um, and I'm not going to say that they're right or wrong in that belief. 
I'm not a, a follower of that belief. They're entitled to their beliefs. Um, but it's so interesting, I just have to point this out real quick, that when you read the book of Job, Satan comes across as somebody who's kind of like a prosecuting attorney, right? Which is so fascinating because in the New Testament, Jesus basically says he's our defense attorney. You know what I'm saying? Isn't, isn't that fascinating? Like whenever God would come to us and we're covered in the blood of the risen Savior, you say, he's a sinner. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. I, I paid for that one. My, my death paid for that sinner, Lord. It is so fascinating that how the Jewish beliefs and the Christian beliefs, they kind of complement each other a little bit, don't they? Isn't that super interesting? Like, gosh, I just love, I love history. I love the Bible. I've been reading the Bible my entire life. Um, it wasn't until I was an older person that I found out, you know, maybe the one translation of the Bible that I've read my entire life isn't the only good translation. In fact, if you want to easily read the Bible, I highly recommend the NET version of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. You can get it for free. It's 20 bucks with the best study notes of any Bible ever. This, this is so well researched, a translation of the scriptures, that many other Bibles borrow from their research to do it. I'm not saying it's the best. I don't know what's best and what's not the best. All I can tell you is uh, I taught my daughter the Bible with the NET because it's so easy to read and understand. You know, people get into the V and thou's and the whereforth and the whatnots and their minds go blank and they don't want to think about it anymore because that's 400 year old language. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's nice to read something in modern language and to go back and check the original Hebrew and Greek and make absolutely sure you're not being lied to. You know what I mean? For those of us who are giant nerds like me and like to study the Bible. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I had to talk about today. My name is Brother Love. Uh, I have a beautiful wife, a beautiful daughter. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. I just wanted to talk about the metaphysical, uh, as Europe would call it, or as we would call it, the spiritual world, and how some things are so true that they're made manifest through video games like Diablo, uh, movies like The Shape of Water, uh, Starry Eyes. Um, oh gosh, guys, don't even get me started on movies. Uh, Mulholland Drive by David Lynch is the most truthful movie ever produced in Hollywood. It's rated R. Don't watch it. It'll ruin your innocence. But that's the whole point of the movie. It's about how it promotes these women to become sirens and then it just chews them up and spits them out. I, I adore the logic and how it's kind of a mystery and you have to unravel the mystery if you want to see the deeper truth of the movie. Just just amazing, Mulholland Drive by David Lynch. Um, in music, oh my gosh, have you guys ever been watching a music video and there's all these symbols going on in the music video? Where do you guys think they get those from? People are drawn to symbols. Like from the very beginning of mankind, people love idolatry, which is why God <laughs> made it one of the Ten Commandments. It's like, uh, remember when Moses had the serpent on the staff and they had to, to break that later so the people wouldn't worship it? I mean, people just love to take something and say, oh, this is the, the sacred pillow where he laid his head and we will worship it, yea, verily. And everybody's wearing pillow-shaped necklaces around their neck and they ask, what would the pillow do? Uh, silly stuff, man. People people are, are silly with that kind of thing. But, <laughs> again, this is not the... Uh, the majority view on any of this. Um, I'm of the faith that spiritual beings exist. Oh, we never really talked about the Jesus thing, did we? How Jesus cast out demons and all that. So let's talk about the Nephilim. What is a Nephilim? So you have an angel, which doesn't have a body, spirit, and soul. It's, it's missing an ingredient. And you got a human who has all three of those things. And when they have a child, it is this magnificent creature. I don't know what they look like. The Bible describes them in many different ways, but uh, let's just say they were giants for the, the, the sake of argument. Remember like uh, when David fought Goliath, he fought the giant who was the offspring of Nephilim, supposedly. Anyway, uh, let's just think of them as giants. What happens when a giant dies, but its spirit can't go to heaven or hell? Ah! Super interesting! The Nephilim 
are spirits that roam the world. They, they look from one body of water, which is a human body, to another body. Um, they just roam seeking who they can enter. If you read the New Testament, Jesus says some amazing, interesting things about the Nephilim. Um, but again, if we go back to Jude, I believe that when Jesus won the fight over Satan with his crucifixion, and he grabbed the, the keys to the gate of hell, you know, life and death, now he died for all our sins, and we who believe in him uh, get to go to heaven um, if we do his will, right? Um, again, I think that that took care of the whole spiritual demons thing. Uh, why do I believe that, and do I know it for a fact? No, I don't know it for a fact. But now I'm going to tell you why I believe it. There's a Jewish book, or early writing, um, I think we would call it like a deuterocanical or an apocryphal work. Um, it's known as the Book of Tobit. Super interesting thing about the Book of Tobit, it talks about the casting out of demons. So through secular sources, we have information that at one point in society, demons definitely existed and inhabited the bodies of men. Um, but at a certain point, the massive numbers of them seem to dwindle to nothing. What, what one event happened in history that might have something? Oh, yes, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Hmm, that's super fascinating. In fact, there were lots of people who cast out demons uh, back in ancient Judaism. I'm trying to remember exactly. Oh, gosh, what is, the, what is the scripture? It's in the New Testament. I just want to look this up real quick. Forgive me for not being prepared. But uh, let's see, Bible. Um, we know Paul, but who are you? Oh, this is good stuff. Uh, Acts chapter 19, ladies and gentlemen. Acts chapter 19. Let's go there. This is super fascinating. Super fascinating. Yeah, the uh, believers used to be called followers of the way before they became known as Christians. Then check this out. This is super interesting. Um, but some itinerant... Jewish exorcists try to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, why would they use the name of the Lord? Well, just like in the book of Tobit, just like in other Jewish histories that we can read, people often took an object from a person and invoked their name like, this was the ring of Solomon, and in the name of Solomon I cast you out, demon, uh, over those who were possessed by evil spirits, saying, I sternly warn you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, seven sons of a man named, of a man named uh, Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. They were using the name of Jesus to cast out demons. Uh, but the evil spirits responded to them. Hey, I know Jesus, and I know Paul. But who are you? Then the man who was possessed by the evil spirits jumped on them and whooped their butts into submission. <laughs> this is brother love being silly. He prevailed against them so that they fled from that house naked and wounded. Super fascinating stuff. Where, where are all those at? Yeah, I've seen the movie Exorcist. I, I hear about strange stories here and there. But where's this giant proliferation that is recorded in ancient texts? that we don't have self-evident in front of us today. I absolutely believe in angels and demons and Nephilim. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. It's, it's just super fascinating how all this stuff seems to coincide with certain events happening, right? I love the Bible. Um, for those of you who are interested in an actual deep study of the Bible, on my Twitch channel with my daughter by my side, I read the entire Bible from start to finish including several of the deuterocanicals and apocryphal works, including the Book of Enoch. Um, feel free to look through the library and listen to what you're interested in listening to. And if you have questions, get back with me, and I will try to get back to you with answers. Um, but gosh, I think I've talked about everything I wanted to about the lore and the spiritual side of Diablo. Um, this is probably going to be eye-opening for some of you and for those of you who just don't believe that way that's that's completely fine study to show yourself approved don't take my word for anything i'm a nobody i'm just a country boy from georgia you know what i'm saying i'm not no i'm a nobody you know don't put your trust in another human being your soul's too valuable for that 
uh, work out your relationship with God, uh, establish your own faith, your own beliefs. Um, but for those of you who are interested in a little bit of a deeper dive into the, the secular histories and how things manifest themselves, I hope that this was an enlightening uh, video for you guys. Uh, that, that ends my talk for today. Um, God bless you guys very much. I love you. I, I hope you have a great day. And uh, <laughs> very grateful to have a, such a wonderful, rich subject to talk about today. Uh, Brother Love loves this kind of stuff. I mean, the Bible's great, man. History, history is great. Because while it doesn't repeat itself, it does rhyme. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be it. I, I wish you all the best and happy Mother's Day. Bye, guys.